Hello and welcome back to the Elephant Lounge. I'm your host Tuesday and I want to thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the intro of a new series that I am going to begin. This is a series where I will be discussing a variety of topics as they relate to demonstrating the guilt of a defendant. Now during the time that I have spent online discussing true crime and conspiracies, I've noticed a number of trends. Number one, people seem to know what to think but they have no idea how to think. Think. Number two, certain people who discuss popular cases online do so only after being exposed to a heavy amount of propaganda surrounding the case in question. Number three, supporters of murders, rapists, pedophiles may or may not know the guilt of the defendant. That is to say, while a number of people are genuine in their ignorance, there are a number of people who know very well the defendant in question is guilty, but for some unhealthy mental reason they desire the defendant to get off for their crime. So with the case of Michael Jackson, Nambla obviously knows that Michael Jackson is guilty, but they support him because he attempted to normalize the behavior of a grown man sleeping in bed with a child. Number four, there's a cult-like devotion. Those who support murderers, rapists, pedophiles tend to behave like cult members. There is zero tolerance in questioning the innocence of the defendant. If an innocence theory is ever debunked in such a way that there is clear evidence confirming their narrative is false, instead of accepting this bit of information and altering the way they view the case, they merely tweak their narrative to fit the new information, but they hold on to the original conclusion. This is also something very common among people who believe in conspiracies. There are many instances in which people are presented with evidence, confronted and corrected with facts, and yet they refuse to acknowledge it. They will carry on making no correction in their posts, their videos, whatever. One is often left wondering why anyone who believes as they do would feel the need to lie or ignore facts. Number five, many of these supporters of murders, rapists, pedophiles appear to be lacking in their education. Many have difficulties with the English language. This is something that I've talked about many times when it comes to Michael Jackson supporters. Very poor skills in writing, so it's very difficult to communicate with them. Uh, they have difficulty following logical thought and a complete absence of understanding the scientific method. It's because of these deficiencies that we find they are easily swayed by sophomoric general talking points. For example, they will listen to a long documentary or television series and become thoroughly convinced of a conspiracy or some other perceived injustice. They simply lack the understanding or insight to decipher that what they have watched is propaganda. They do not know when to question something presented to them. They blindly believe the entire justice justice system is corrupt, even though no proof of that has actually been presented. Now, at the same time, all the evidence that was used to convict someone is roundly criticized or just dismissed completely, simply because this is what they've been told to do. Most of the claims made by supporters that revolve around any evidence are indeed bold-faced lies, but these people are completely unaware since they once again have blindly put their their faith in the person or entity telling them these so-called facts about the evidence. Number six, most every single supporter of murderers, rapists, pedophiles have very, very little understanding of the law, how the different entities in law work, and why it is the majority of cases taken to trial are pretty damn solid cases. Now, there are indeed rare cases that go to trial and play out in a nightmarish way, and I will discuss one of these cases, and ultimately, we will examine it and see how the case fell apart in a very very glorious way. I will discuss why these cases eventually do fall apart and why we should not give in to paranoid ideas concerning our justice system in general. Of course, these are just a few of the many coincidences I've discovered, and I will do my best to keep this series simple but valuable. I will be offering up ways for you to approach material, how to analyze information in a logical fashion. You'll learn about propaganda and when to question 
in things that are presented to you and what questions you should be asking. You'll also learn a bit more about the law and why some cases are never quote unquote officially solved. I will also be talking about cults and cult-like behavior and giving you some examples of this behavior as we discuss a variety of different cases. We'll also talk about DNA, forensic evidence, how to understand and put that information together. We'll discuss how cases are indeed solved and how the current CSI obsessed culture we live in is destroying our ability to think logically, causing havoc in our justice system. Now, obviously, you feel free to use the comment section to ask questions and have discussions about the many cases I will be mentioning during the course of this series. Now, let's get started with episode one, which is what is propaganda? Now, one definition states information, especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or a point of view. And we do indeed see a lot of propaganda as it pertains to politics. But in this series, we're going to be focusing mainly on true crimes. And later, I will be doing a bit of a section on conspiracies. But I really want to build upon the concepts and ideas that we first learn about true crimes. We are noticing an influx of propaganda as it pertains to true crimes, and we're going to explore that. One thing we have to keep in mind is that not all propaganda is factually wrong. For example, when it comes to politics, both sides generally will use posters or memes, something that we see in our current age, to expose the importance of a political issue. Both sides can present real facts that do indeed support their position. However, if only one side of the issue is presented, the material can be deemed propaganda. Most all propaganda triggers an emotional reaction and plays upon the good sensibilities of people. In the example of true crime, cases, most people recoil at the thought of an innocent man in jail or someone being falsely accused of a crime. Other propaganda can be quite dangerous. This comes into play when the information presented is not factual and can lead to harm. Whenever you're presented with information that is clearly focused on presenting a specific narrative, you simply need to recognize it for what it is. It could be true, but you will need to look further. You will not be able to arrive at a logical objective conclusion merely using this one piece of information. For example, if you watch a Netflix series like Making a Murderer, you need to understand that there is one narrative you are being told to believe. Some objective material may indeed be thrown in to give you the comfort of believing that you have all the facts, but more than likely you are not being told the full story. And no matter how long it is or how much footage of the trial they show you. In the example of making a murderer, we know that they did show some footage from the trial, but when you read the transcripts of the trial, you see that they cut up the responses and had, they showed responses from different questions. So somebody would ask a question, but they show a response that was actually given for another question. That is misleading. That is propaganda. In the example of making a murder as well, it stated over and over again that the Averys are poor and not well liked. The message of this series is to give the impression that the government is after Avery only because they messed up a prior false conviction. While they talk about Avery's past, and why police had reason to not trust Avery, they want the viewer to believe he was purposely railroaded for the rape case and later again for murder. We have to ask why. Why would they have railroaded him for rape? And what sense would it make for them to later railroad him again? Why would they go after Stephen when they supposedly know he's innocent? Why would the police want a murderer to go free all for the sake of going after Avery? Instead, these questions go unasked and unanswered. You, the viewer, are merely supposed to accept or believe that these things happen because the law is bad and people in law enforcement are obviously bad because they told you it was true. We are expected to believe the police would rather arrest an innocent man knowing that the real killer was free and could possibly kill again, exposing them for trying to cover up 
and attack an innocent man. I found similar beliefs when I decided to read about the Amanda Knox case. When I first decided to learn more about her case, I found a number of blogs, message boards, websites that were all geared towards stating Amanda's innocent. It's Amanda's innocent. To them, it was so obvious she's innocent. Of course, I recognize this as propaganda. If it's so obvious, why would anyone think otherwise? Why did the court find her and Raffaele guilty the first time and again after their appeal? Why would Italy have a burning desire to frame an American girl and her Italian boyfriend? Why would anyone from the Italian police physically hit Amanda knowing that the U.S. Embassy would eventually be involved? And surely the Italian authorities would be aware that this case would be heavily scrutinized among those in the U.K. and the United States. You have a victim from the U.K. and you have a suspect from the United States. Whenever we are presented with something that seems a bit overwhelming, it's always best to begin asking why. Now, not all cases are the same. There are indeed some cases presented quite thoroughly in the media and in other forms of documentation, meaning there are good documentaries out there, especially if it comes to any true crime case. Local stations do a wonderful job at covering a lot of various cases. The Jesse Smollett case that we saw earlier this year was covered very well by the local stations in Chicago. Everywhere else, not so much, but I don't want to just bash all people that make documentaries or make you believe that all of media is bad or they're always being subjective or they're always putting out propaganda. That's not necessarily the case. And that's the point of this is for us to study what propaganda is, understand what it is, recognize it, and then be sure that we go the step further and ask the right questions. Now, everyone has bias. There's nothing wrong with bias. It's something we all develop over time, and it's generally created through our worldview, our class status, our race, our sex, our families and friends, and overall experiences that we've obtained over our lifetimes. Young people tend to be quite naive and ambitious, while older people can become stuck in their worldview. Someone who's had a number of negative experiences with the law may automatically be biased into believing that all of law enforcement should not be trusted, while a person who's had positive experiences may believe that law enforcement is correct and just. Both of these experiences are valid, yet both of these experiences should be recognized for what they are, experiences that will shape our initial reaction when we first begin to learn about a new case or an issue. So this means we have to know what our bias is, and then we have to make the effort to switch, as it were, to put ourselves in a different position. And we see this a lot in politics. We always have to remember that, yes, the right side may have a lot of facts and the left may have a lot of facts. And you may be a person who looks at an issue, for instance, and you recognize that there are facts on both sides. But just because of your life experiences, you're going to side with one side or the other and another other person may understand the facts of both sides as well, but because of their experience, they will be on the other side. That's just the way it is. When it comes to true crime, however, what is a little bit easier is that we have objective answers. For instance, when it comes to Michael Jackson, either he was or he wasn't. When we follow the facts and we include all of the evidence and all of the circumstantial evidence, there is but one answer that actually fits into the puzzle and makes sense, and that is he's guilty. In order to believe that he's not guilty, you basically have to, you have to wreak havoc everywhere. You have to accuse everyone of being a liar, and what makes more sense, everyone's horrible or one man is horrible. That's something that you have to ask yourself. Propaganda is something that aims to appeal to your emotions. Its goal is to convince you of a particular narrative and do so in a way that exploits your caring nature. In the case of politics, the best example of this can be seen in a push for political correctness. Those who seek to change language of individuals are able to 
convince the population into believing certain terms are harmful or that certain groups should not be criticized. And obviously, this is very dangerous. For example, we are now being asked to refer to obese people as a person of size. This phrase is of little use to anyone since everyone can be categorized as having a particular size. While the intention is meant to encourage people to be kind to others and not go around calling people fat, this change forces people to feel uncomfortable or they're having wrong think should they use the term fat or obese. It also can become dangerous since those who are obese are indeed putting their lives in danger. If we cannot be honest with those who are overweight, we may end up avoiding ever discussing the topic with those who clearly require a change in habit and diet, all in the name of our own desire to be nice. In this example, our kindness and our natural desire to not offend or hurt people is being exploited. And ultimately, this exploitation has allowed a number of fat people to remain unhealthy, while at the same time, we're praising people and encouraging them to be proud of their refusal to care for their bodies. We essentially become more concerned about how we look and in many cases enjoy displaying for others how tolerant and accepting we are of others, which is all that virtue signaling we see. We sacrifice truth for our desire to be comfortable. So this is where propaganda can become very dangerous. It exploits our good nature. When it comes to Michael Jackson, for instance, we're going to get back to him. You always hear the same lines. It's very repetitive. And this goes back into the cult-like mentality that we see with Michael Jackson fans. They all seem to run on a script and say the same things. They say, well, we don't know. We, we don't really know. We weren't there. We can't possibly know if he really did or he didn't. And so we are now being manipulated to not look at the actual logic and facts, put all the information together. We're not allowed to have a realistic point of view that a man who behaves like a pedophile, lives like a pedophile, hangs around children like a pedophile, has multiple allegations as a pedophile, behaves like a child just like a pedophile would. We're, we're supposed to dumb ourselves down because now we're being manipulated. We're being told that, well, we don't know for sure. Nobody wants to see an innocent man go to jail, right? Nobody wants to accuse someone of pedophilia. That's the manipulation. So it's always this aim to get us to move away from thinking logically about something and looking at the facts in an objective, reasonable manner. And instead, we should give in to feelings. Well, we don't want Michael Jackson to be a pedophile. Why would you want Michael Jackson to be a pedophile? You're projecting your own feelings. You're the perverts here. You're the ones who are perverts. You want him to be a pedophile. That's your own doing. I choose not to see that perversion. Just because a grown man sleeps in a bed with a young boy and that young boy accuses him of sexual assault, they're the liar. It's innocent. Michael said it was innocent. That is pure manipulation. And this is what I'm talking about when it comes to propaganda. It's this attempt to prey upon your good sensibilities. And we see it all the time when it comes to these true crimes. It always starts with rehabilitating the the character of the defendant. We saw that with Amanda Knox. Well, she's just an innocent girl. Now, they don't want to talk about her drug use or her promiscuity. We can't talk about that. You're not allowed to judge her. She was just like everybody else. It's all about trying to get us to be kind, right? It's all about being kind. And when it comes to true crime and dealing with facts and looking at things in a logical manner, this has nothing to do with being kind. I don't care about being kind. What I care about is putting the facts together, looking at things logically, and realizing I don't I don't care who the defendant is. I don't care if it's a male, a female, a rich person, a poor person. I don't care if they've donated to charity or not. I'm going to look at that person as I would anyone else. I'm going to look at the facts that surround the case and arrive at that objective conclusion. You follow the evidence. You don't make the evidence follow 
your conclusion or your belief, as it were. It's all about trying to get you to believe something. You'll notice that they never lead you to believing Michael Jackson is innocent through the facts. They never do that. They dismiss all the facts while they hold on to the emotion. It's all about getting you to that point and holding you there. And you're not allowed to question it. And that's where that cult-like mentality comes in. And it all starts with propaganda. So we need to know how to recognize it. Now, for this next episode that I'm going to do, I am going to present to you a perfect example of Propaganda 101. We're going to break it down. We're going to go through everything. I'm going to show you exactly what questions you need to be asking and what the actual facts are. And somebody had actually posted it on my podcast thinking that, you know, I was going to be swayed by this nonsense. No. See, that's the difference between supporters and people who are objective. That's the difference. I am not swayed by that. And we have to talk about the the lack of education. We have to talk about that because it's important for people to learn how to think. Now, I, before I sign off, I want to give a thank you to Roberta Glass, and she is going to be helping and giving me a little bit of insight later on. We are going to do a few podcasts together where we're going to hash and talk about this stuff. We're really going to focus on really teaching how to approach these cases, learning how to put information together. And number one, you can't be lazy. That's the number one thing. You can't be lazy. You always have to go the extra step. That's number one. So let's just go ahead and recap. Number one, we know that propaganda can be biased or misleading, and it's used to promote a particular point of view, or in the case of politics, a political cause or a political issue. We know that propaganda can be factual. It can indeed be factual. However, once we recognize that something is propaganda, we need to make mental note what questions we need to ask. What information are they not telling us? Always pay attention to that. And then those will be the questions that you'll need to ask and those will be the answers you will need to seek. Always remember that propaganda generally is trying to trigger an emotion. It's going to try and manipulate your good nature. So if you see something that's pulling on your heartstring or it's trying to get you to sway in a certain way and you feel that compassion, that's all lovely, okay? There's nothing wrong with having both passion and facts. Again, it's not always wrong. It's not always untrue. You can pair that passion with facts. However, you need to look for information that is going to lead you to a conclusion using the facts and not using the emotion. Are they trying to get you to believe in something using an emotion or trying to manipulate you? That's the biggest thing that you need to pay attention to. If somebody's telling you, well, it's because it's the nice thing to do. It's because this would be so much better for us. The road to hell is paved with wonderful intentions. And we've seen this too much in our society not to learn how to recognize it. We have to learn how to recognize this. It's so very important. So whenever you're presented with any type of information and it has this specific narrative. All you need to do is recognize it. Now I'm going to look for information that answers the questions that you didn't answer. We always want to ask why whenever we're presented with some absurd theory of, you know, the government is after this one person. We have to ask ourselves why. Why would the government be after this one person, especially when there are nobody? It's one thing to believe like the government was after James Traficant, for instance. That was a very popular case back in, I don't know, what was it early 2000s, I want to say? James Traficant was a congressman and, you know, he was a crazy guy. Definitely a crazy guy and he did some crazy stuff. I don't necessarily think that there was a conspiracy there, but I can understand where someone would think that because at least it makes sense, right? He's a political figure. So you can sort of understand that he was huffing and puffing. He was kind of throwing a fit, being a whistleblower. He was causing trouble 
for some people, you can kind of understand where someone would think, okay, yeah, I can see why the government would be after a person like that. But like Stephen Avery or Amanda Knox or even Michael Jackson, why? You'll hear Michael Jackson supporters all the time. They'll say, oh, that that uh, prosecutor, he, he really was after Michael Jackson. Why? For what reason? They just expect you to believe it because they told you that. They don't follow it up with any facts. You'll notice that they never follow it up with any facts. They just tell you that that's what happened. And that's the kind of stuff we have to be able to recognize so that we can instantly go, okay, you can believe them, but you need to follow that up. You need to find the evidence that supports that conclusion. Okay, and I will end it here. When I come back, we will go over that wonderful piece of propaganda and we will tear it apart. Just tear it apart. And I will be back 